Okay, we are live. Hello, guys. Hello. So, uh, <laughs> welcome everyone to RLD podcast. We're here today, me, Oscar, with my uh, with my colleague Daniel, as you've seen in the earlier episodes. And uh, yeah, it's my first time on on the podcast today. Uh, and together with us, we have uh, John Findlay from uh, Urban Fresh. Um, so, you know, start by introducing yourself. Who are you? What do you do? Your yeah, so my background as well. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I'm John. I'm the CEO now of Urban Fresh, which is a vertical farming company in Barcelona. Um, yeah, I grew up in the U.S. I've always been interested in social entrepreneurship studied in in spain and and now i'm the ceo of a company all right so start by telling a little bit more about your uh, personal interests what do you do when you don't work etc okay um so if i'm not working i'm usually uh trading or investing or playing the guitar and now with corona you there's not much else you can do so um so yeah I'm just at home all right all right so tell us a little bit about your uh, previous experience you know i we know you since before me and daniel uh, so we know that you've been to valencia and studied and etc so so you know start by telling us a little bit about your history wh where you grew up where you studied and how you came to be where you are today okay so yeah i grew up in new jersey a very small town like um probably like a couple hundred people in my town and then i studied at rutgers university which was a, a big school i used to do like uh, startup competitions there and you know like funded by banks and i was always interested in entrepreneurship i was like the vp of some entrepreneur club in you know in my in my university and then i did a study abroad program in valencia where uh, my major was in finance and I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave Spain. I didn't want to go back to the U.S. So I found a way to stay, and I looked for, you know, a, a university in Barcelona. Uh, my previous work experience, I worked at um, as a server, as a waiter. So I have a background in the hospitality industry, I guess you could say. And then um, I worked in supply chain at Johnson and Johnson. Then I started working for the Fab Lab here in Barcelona, and I was more on a, you know, an internship kind of basis. And now I'm now I'm the CEO of a company. Yeah, so that's kind of how that went. Awesome, awesome. So obviously, I have a little bit of uh, background information since I know you from before, but. Uh, for the listeners here, um, tell us a little bit about when you decided to move uh, from uh, from the U.S. to Spain, and the fact that you didn't speak Spanish, and then you moved right away <laughs> to to study finance at the university. So, how was that experience? Oh, that was fun, actually. So, I always wanted to learn Spanish. I was always into it. Um, I had a friend that played. I used to play football or soccer at the university level in the U.S. And I had a friend that was from Spain who played on my team um, and he didn't speak much English. So I would try to help him with English and he would teach me Spanish. And then I ended up visiting Spain, um, visiting his family in Madrid and I wanted to come back. And the only school that was available was a school in Valencia for me to do an exchange. And in order to do that, you know, I had to take an entry exam for to know that my Spanish level was good enough because all the classes were in Spanish and I didn't know my Spanish was okay you know like I could get the basics down like hey how are you where are you from this is what I do this is where I live but then other than that I couldn't do anything I couldn't you know couldn't communicate so then having to take like statistics and finance and uh, business strategy I forget what else I took but it was all in Spanish so it was a bit of a yeah, it was a bit of a challenge. I didn't understand anything for the first two months, I think, in class. I was just there. I would just be there, listen, but I didn't, nothing was going in. But somehow I passed and and then, yeah, and then I wanted to stay. And 
So yeah, that was that's how that went. But it was fun. It was a good. It was a nice experience. I learned a lot. I learned another language. Just that's how you learn, really. Just going out there. Best way to learn is to throw yourself in the sea when you can't swim, right? That's exactly what I did. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned earlier that you you like to uh, trade on your spare time. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you studied finance. We studied finance together. Uh, so. Tell us a little bit about more about what what you trade, what you invest in, um, wow. and, and how's it going. <laughs> that could be a, that could be a whole podcast on itself. <laughs> But I started trading um, uh, options in the U.S. on the U.S. stock market. Well, first I was like, I made my first trade. I think as soon as I could, it was like 17 or 18. You know, you have to be of age. Or I even maybe I even asked my mom to buy me a stock for me or, or whatever. And it was I I'll, I'll never forget. It was like a Ocean Powers. I even forget what it. But they use like ocean waves to take electricity. You know. So I've always been interested in, in green energy and, you know, social entrepreneurship. I guess. But now, so I started with regular trading, just buying stocks of companies that I liked, and then moved over to options trading because I wanted the volatility. I wanted the movement. I didn't have much money and I wanted to make a lot of money with the little money I had. So options was a way to do it. And it's limited risk as well because you can only lose what you invest into. I don't know how much you guys know about options. Oscar, I know you know a lot. Daniel, I don't know how much you know. A decent amount. I'm not like a pro trader, but yeah, I understand what you're talking about. Okay. And then... uh And now I I moved over to the to the crypto world, um, and it's going pretty well, <laughs> I would say, because it's just as volatile as like the you know the options, but I don't know. I just believe much more in a decentralized banking system, and then you know just regular companies that could print any any amount of money or any amount of stock that they wanted and your investment would just be devalued. So yeah, now I'm more into a decentralized form of yeah, money flow, everything. So that's, that's on the side, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, we will, we won't get uh, too much into the crypto and the finance <laughs> side of it, but uh, definitely we'll invite you for another episode further on where we can uh, perhaps discuss a little bit about more about that. But no, <laughs> now you mentioned a little bit earlier about uh, your social entrepreneurship, your, your love for that, how, how that came to develop and your first stock experience. So um, tell us a little bit more about um, your current professional experience, where you work right now at Urban Fresh, and uh, how you started out, how it led to what it is today, the company, and how's it going? Right. So it's kind of crazy. Um, we just started. The company was, you know, uh, like signed or whatever, created four months ago. So still, we're not in any operations. We it's still not there yet but we're in like the building and and soon we'll be able to you know so soon we'll be running but it all started um pretty much with an idea which is kind of crazy you know it's just one day being at home like oh, you know i think that would that would work so i was at the time i was working with um next food and and which is a they do vertical farming in denmark and So basically I was working for them and there was an opportunity to do it here. And, but they couldn't, they didn't have the resources to do it in Barcelona themselves. Um, so somebody else needed to run the farm. And basically because I had experience with them and everything else, the opportunity just came up to the point where um, I said, I'll run the farm. I can create the business model around it. I'll do everything. and. And so that's kind of how it went. It was just a random idea that I had. Well, not random, but a thought out idea. And I was just presented it to the right people in the right time. And somehow, um, yeah, so we're just, just starting the journey, really. So can't say too much about what's it gonna, going to be, because I don't know. Mm. But 
basically the idea is it's aeroponics. So the plants, it's a vertical farming company that uses aeroponics. So there's a couple different ways of growing plants um, indoors. So that you have your hydroponics, you have your aquaponics, and each use a different way, a different form. But aeroponics is the most sustainable, is the most resource efficient. And so, yeah, that's what I'm dedicating to. So the plants grow without soil in a mist environment, which allows for airflow and, and water reusage. So it just gets refiltered back into the system and back up. And everything that's not used gets re-put in. And there's a nutrient-filled solution where these plants are getting sprayed with, and that's how they grow. And because you can control the entire growth environment, the plants grow quicker. There's no bacteria because it's inside, it's closed. Well, there's not no, but there's less bacteria than if they were outside. There's 95% less water, 75% less fertilizer. And, you know, you're 100, 150 times more productive because you're growing in vertically. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I actually have, I can show you real quick. Let me take my laptop. I can show you. So here I have some some basil, mm -hmm. and I don't know how well you can see. But yeah, we can see some uh, some roots. Yeah. Yeah. So the roots, there's literally no soil, um, which is pretty cool. It's a concept that, you know, I didn't think was even possible for a plant to to grow without any soil, but. Mm -hmm. But it's um it's pretty efficient and most importantly it has uh, better taste. It's more fr fresh because you, as soon as you can cut it, you can you can eat it. It didn't go through long transport. It's there's no pesticides. There's nothing. And who who is the uh, end consumer of the product in the end? Like, are you selling the things that you grow or are you selling the actual technology there? So right now we're selling the the things that we grow the plants oh. we're selling the plants to restaurants and hotels and then end consumer so basically it'd be b2b b2c so to restaurants and then to to everybody in barcelona who would like some fresh plants locally grown zero kilometers no pesticides mm -hmm. and uh what about selling these uh grow houses or whatever you want to call them, to the like, end consumer. Is that an option? Or have you yeah. guys considered that? Yeah, uh, definitely. It's something we don't have now, but it was, it's something we would like to have at some point. So I would like to sell some mini systems to end consumers so they can grow at their home. So everybody you know, could learn about the technology um, and eat fresh food. Because at the end of the day, more and more people are eating healthier, fresher, they're more conscious about where their food is coming from. Yeah. Uh, did you actually come up with the idea or uh, is that your partner from Denmark who developed the technology or did it even exist before? So it exists. Um, it exists before. It was first developed by NASA, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and then some companies, there's a couple companies in the U.S. that are big. There's companies in Japan, but the person who developed the technology for this is the partner in in Denmark. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. Okay. And uh, like, what what are your first goals for developing this uh, technology or business? Is, are you going to like try to uh, sell, uh, get cash flow first, or are you first uh, trying to scale rapidly? What's what's the plans? No. So the there's like a big saying in entrepreneurship is to do things that don't scale when you're first mm -hmm. starting off, right? So it's uh, it's going and talking to your end customer always because, you know, you're not going to be able to spend an hours and hours with your end customer later on. So basically now I'm just talking and learning as much from the market to see what's the best way to approach it, what's the best way to sell to them what do what's their pains what's their gains um yeah. yeah what do you see in terms of future like do you think that this technology will be able to um 
kind of revolutionize uh, on, on a big scale? Do you see that in the future or like what is your vision basically for, for this? So I think now this one, this vertical farming and indoor farming, I don't think it would take agriculture completely out of the out of the picture, but it's meant to to be part of the solution, let's say, because agriculture is so unsustainable. It is, you know, highly resource intensive. And like 70% 70, 70 of all the water usage is for agriculture in the world, all of all fresh water. So it's not about changing the entire industry. It's about making a dent and, and just trying to make a bit, like make an impact basically for, yeah. for the good. Yeah. Okay. Is that like uh, you call them farms, right? Right now you have like one garage, or do you have several like uh, I don't know uh, episodes of uh, in the building? How, like how how is the operation right now? Right. So right. Uh, so here I just have one system behind that system growing, mm -hmm. but um, I don't know how well you can see over there. Oh. Will be an entire farm that's four levels up. 50 square meters, but really 200 square meters. That's pretty big. Yeah, but it's equivalent to like a 2,000 square meter farm outside because the plants can grow closer together. Yeah, of course, and vertically, so it's uh, more efficient also in terms of space. Exactly. So uh, you you mentioned earlier about uh, about the next food that uh, it developed the idea kind of sort of developed in Denmark and then you've met you met the you met the guy from Next Food and then you took the idea further to to Barcelona where you currently sell. So mm -hmm. start by telling a little bit about how you met this guy and uh, how you guys came to expand to specifically Barcelona. Right. So. I don't know how, I don't know how much detail I can go in to that, but his name is Rasmus, mm -hmm. and um, he gave a presentation at GBS, Geneva Business School. And when he gave the presentation, I went up to him and I was just, just told him, "Teach me everything you know, <laughs> please. You know, <laughs> and I'll work for free. Just teach me, please. Just teach me everything and whatever I can do to help. You know, I will because." When he gave the, the presentation, he really focused on, you know, looking for, he took some time off and he's focused on, okay, what do I want to do? Um, and he was looking for entrepreneurial ideas, basically. And it was something that he wanted to have in high impact, but also high potential reward. So I really related to that. And so, yeah, as soon as the presentation was over, I went up to him and asked him, if I could work for free for him to teach me, send him my resume the next day. And then from there, it just started building. He like um, when I worked at the Fab Lab, he had presented me to them and because he was going to have a farm at some at another place. At the Fab Lab, but. Um, what is Fab Lab for our listeners who haven't heard of it before? <laughs> yeah, so the Fab Lab is a. Uh, is a center for digital fabrication. So there's a bunch of them all over the world. And it's, it started in MIT. And basically the goal of them, of the Fab Lab, uh, if, excuse me if there's anybody from the Fab Lab, maybe I say it wrong. But from my understanding is they want it to be a center for makers. So instead of going outside the city and you know ordering something from China, you can go to these Fab Labs and you can make you know, basically whatever you want, because they have, you know, CNC machines, you can weld, you can metal cut, 3D print, you know, like, uh, they're innovators, pretty much. And, and they also, uh, like, offer courses, masters, they offer a lot. And so how did it develop from uh, Fab Lab to what it is today, this farm that we've, that we've seen here, this vertical farm? Yeah, so, wow. So I was working with them. At the, they were trying to do a farm there. 
in the fab lab together, but it was a it was a mix of of a bunch of different things. It was it, they were trying to do food and materials and energy, and I had went to Rasmus and said, "This is um, I don't think this is going to work. I think in order for you know for this to for the farm to work, it needs its own space, it needs its own team, it needs to be its own functional business." And uh, and yeah, so that's kind of that's pretty much it. It's how it started, and then it just grew from there. And we brought other people on the team. Uh, currently, it's me managing it. I'm the only one on Urban Fresh, but soon soon there will be more people. Uh, but we have I have an advisory board, and that helps me. And yeah. So right now you're basically alone. And, uh, or are you have like, do you have some team members that you're managing? Like, how does Currently, that... I am alone. Okay, okay. completely. A... That's, that's pretty insane. Karen, yeah. So technically, yeah, I'm alone. Um, but I have a, a support system. Like I said, um, like the, the board members of mm -hmm. the business. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, yeah, mentors. So I don't feel alone. But um, but I'm alone. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, they ship the the stuff to Barcelona, and you started building it and starting operating it like all by yourself, right? Correct. Are you in Barcelona right now, or Madrid, or where's the location? No, I'm in I'm in Barcelona. I'm in Poblet now. Mm -hmm. So we heard before also that the technology is uh, well, the technology behind this uh, this farming is way more efficient than traditional agriculture in the way that it doesn't use mm -hmm. any pesticide, it saves a lot of water and stuff like that. And how, how, how has it gained attention in terms of contributions or EU support or something like that? Because it's a very revolutionary technology, I would assume, right? Yeah, so different governments around the world are allowing more than others, mm -hmm. you know, the EU is particularly stringent on food in general but in the northern com uh, countries uh, it's been working really well uh, you know in Denmark Holland it's very it's very popular in Europe um, but yeah so basically they see all the benefits and people are lobbying for this to be allowed in, in other places mm -hmm. So how, how, like, what is the expansion plan? You're, you're planning on, uh, maybe we talked about it a little bit earlier, but you're saying now restaurants, private consumers. What is the next step going from maybe supermarkets or bigger even? And what's the next country uh, you want to expand to, etc.? cetera? So um, another thing, I will think about that when the time comes you know, right now I have I have ideas and I have my my plan, but I know that that plan will just change in in a year or in six months even. So basically, right now I'm taking it day by day and making sure that this run this runs and this works. And then once that's um, once that's happening and once this is running, once the business is working, then is when I will think about expanding but until then it's like i said earlier doing things that don't scale mm -hmm. so tell uh, you were talking earlier about the uh, about the technology behind the the system the vertical system and we saw that it, it doesn't use any soil mm -hmm. uh, could you go perhaps a little bit more in detail in how how this entire system works uh yeah sure so, what's up? A, a process in uh, the steps in which it works and uh, yeah, basically. Well, I, I stuck, you can't go too far in detail, okay. you know, but overall, basically, the, the roots are in a environment, in a box almost, where they're sprayed with water and it creates a mist within the a mist of nutrients within this box where the roots are and because 
it allows for airflow because they're not the roots aren't submerged in water. So in hydroponics, excuse me, and aquaponics, all the roots are submerged in water, right? So that's the main difference is here they're not. It's just a mist. But all the water that the, that's not used just gets filtered back down and then sprayed another again back up to the roots. Mm -hmm. Is that all automated within the box or do you actually like have to manually spray? The um, this mist? is all automated. Mm -hmm. So um, it's programmed based on a certain time, based on the plant, based on everything, how much light, how much you can control everything pretty much. But mm -hmm. with the water, it sprays um, every certain amount of time. How is the electricity cost? I mean, I can imagine that um, if you want to stay competitive, right, uh, in mm -hmm. terms of price, um, the factor of electricity would come in, but at the same time, you are saving on soil and pesticides. So how how is the how is the product uh, like competitive uh, in terms of pricing? Right. So electricity cost is obviously one of the major downfalls of vertical farming because it requires a lot of electricity to run. But like I had said earlier, it's not the entire solution. It's a step in the right direction. So um, if you have like solar panels or something like that, you can greatly reduce the electricity, even have it, and you could even collect rainwater or, you know, and then the system would completely be green. It would be green vertical farming. Only. But um, in terms of pricing, you have to basically we match uh, organic prices because that's the kind of product that we are, we are selling is a high quality, high without pesticides, you know, all the main selling points of organic, but without, but with, sorry, with sustainable features as well. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, we, we have okay, to, have, okay. we have so to charge basically the, the, the entire, op yeah, the entire operation is basically you planting it and then you, uh, harvesting it right there's like no in between or is there some kind of maintenance that you have to perform in the process like how how does it exactly work yeah so you have to so at first the plants are you know germinated in a different system and then they're moved to a bigger system basically so there's a process within the within it but each plant is different so there i can't tell you one exact answer because each plant likes everything a bit different. But there is maintenance, of course. There's, uh, you have to take care of them. You know, there's still plants, they're still alive. I play music. I still, th I think that helps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to the plants? Of course. You're a believer. <laughs> of course. There's a, so like there's different, um, like sizes of these boxes, if I understood you correct. So you move depending on the cycle they are in, the plants are in, you move them to bigger and smaller boxes. Correct. How easy is that? Like uh, you just showed you, they are basically in like a plastic thing. So you just mm -hmm. take it out or is that like more complicated? Yeah, you could take it out or you can move the plant. It's basically what you prefer, but at first you'll need to move the plant itself and it's not, uh, it's not too difficult to do. Mm. You just have to make sure not to damage the roots. Yeah, I understand. So from a business perspective and from the technology perspective, what are some issues that you have encountered so far and how have you overcome them? Or are you still in some sort of uh, issue at the moment or how's it going? Uh, so it's going well. Um, I'm still missing some pieces, some crucial pieces to begin growing. And until I can grow, there's no business, you know? <laughs> so I'm just kind of like here waiting to begin uh, growing pretty much. And I've been talking to people and I'm getting them excited and then I'm having them wait, mm -hmm. you know? And I don't like that. And that's something, um, you know, like I'm considering whether I should be selling them already because I, I 
don't have everything to be able to begin growing, but I'll be having it soon. But other than that, um, it's just a lot of work mm-hmm. and it's a lot of time. So, um, but, but we saw earlier in the podcast some, some basil that you already had, uh, had uh, grown and mm-hmm. we saw some other plants maybe. And, and now you're saying that you can't sell them just yet. What is the reason behind that? Uh, so these plants are more for samples. Uh-huh. It's just like the prototype. Um, I could sell these plants, typically, technically, but um, but I, I want to use them to show the product and to have something here growing. Okay. Yeah. So this is if... not the full production, you know, like this isn't, this is like the prototype, let's say. Okay. So what what is the reason? Because you were saying that uh, you get them excited and then they have to wait. Uh, it takes a lot of time. What what is mm-hmm. the reason for this uh, delay in the process? What is there some issue with uh, with the uh, with the technology itself? It takes a t- long, no. long time to grow. Or? No, no, it's just you know classic supply chain issues, um, logistics, logistical issues, but uh, within nothing. I'll have um, I'll have everything I need. Okay. So, Are there like limitations to what you can grow there, or is it like whatever no, you want? It's basically whatever you want, but not everything makes sense um, on the business side of things, you know. Yeah. So only certain crops make sense, but you can grow whatever you want. You just have to would have to adjust it based on what you want. You so you uh, still hand pick basically like the seeds and so on uh, mm-hmm. in order to like choose what kind of quality product comes out. Is, is there some kind of gene genetic manipulation that you uh, do or do you not like uh, think that is ethical? What's, it, what's your take on that in general? Um, from my understanding, genetical modification in seeds is not permitted in the EU. Okay. Um, in the U.S. it is, but here um, it is not. So, would Would you like that to be allowed, or like, yeah? Um, personally, I think it makes, to me, it makes sense for you to be able to modify the gene, so you could, you know, have you know leaves that are bigger, different colors, or you know. Mm-hmm. basically modify modify the seeds but um, but yeah it would just make sense why not mm-hmm. so um let's uh, go into the to the end part of this we're moving uh, towards the the time limit almost so just on some ending notes here what are your what would be some young some advice for some young up and coming entrepreneurs obviously in your process you're still in this process of uh, of growing this business and scaling it and making it a real competitive product but uh, i mean you're still in the process i guess you have some experience that maybe you could share with, with some of our listeners uh, yeah uh, definitely still in the process I am no means an expert, but uh, basically for the young person, if you have an idea, just go for it and try it out. And if it doesn't work out, you're going to learn from it. Like I had um, many ideas that I've tried and failed and, you know, this is the first one that's been going well. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But yeah, just go out and do it. All right. So, uh, is there on the, on an ending note? Is there something else you would like to to add, John? Uh, no, no, no. Thanks for for having me on. When can we buy your carrots? <laughs> <laughs> carrots ah, is on the other is on the other end of it because you know okay. it's, it's the root you eat with carrots. <laughs> so, so carrots is actually a problem growing them. It's not a problem. It's just. Uh, with our systems, we're focusing more on on herbs mm-hmm. and aromatic plants. Have to grow them okay. upside down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Well, we would like to uh, say big thank you to you, John, for uh, for uh, coming on, on this podcast and uh, contributing with uh, this knowledge to, to our, our listeners. And um, I mean, hopefully you had a good time and until next time. Yeah, yes. of course. Yeah, next time uh, a blockchain podcast. Right. <laughs> Feel free to, to have me on. Awesome. <laughs> yep. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very yeah. much, John. Thank have you guys. Day. You as well.